My name's Keith Reed, and I'm the Chief Exec at the Parent Infant Foundation. Real pleasure to welcome you to another in the series of the first. 1001 Days Movements lunchtime webinars. We hold them every month about the same time and about the same week. Um, and if you don't know about the first 1001 Days Movement, it's a campaign group of over 200 charities, professionals, professional bodies, all working together to highlight the importance of babies' emotional well-being development. And there's lots more about the movement on the Parent Infant Foundation website as well. So it's a real pleasure to be joined this month by Penelope Leach, who is a research psychologist specialising in child development, fellow of the British Psychological Society, honorary senior research fellow at Tavistock, um, founding member of Association for Infant Mental Health, and was recognised in the Queen's birthday honours back in June. And we found out before we started going to collect your beautiful acknowledgement award <laughs> tomorrow. I understand. Is that at Windsor Castle or is that That's at Windsor Castle? Windsor right. Castle, fantastic. And we were we were chatting through the outfit that you will be wearing tomorrow, which sounds sounds fabulous. I think probably two of the most important things I forgot to mention is you're both a mother and a grandmother as well. Um, and it sounds like the whole gang are coming to see you at Christmas, which is absolutely wonderful. So this session is slightly different. Penelope doesn't have a presentation to give in sent in questions in advance, but there's also for everyone here a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So Q&A down there. So as we go along, starting now, please put your questions to Penelope in the Q&A uh, section, and we can answer them live during this lunchtime session. So Penelope, I'm going to kick off if I may. Um, your, ba your baby and child, so that was published first in 1978. Is that, is that right? That's right. Um, and so it's been, it's been pretty successful. I, my notes here say thousands of people, including lots of people listening to this webinar, would have been raised by parents who read the book. Um, yes, I think, but, I think that has to be true, but... I, 50 years is a ridiculous length of time to have a book on them, you know, on available, which is why it had to be rewritten or killed. And and what was the what was the prompt to do it now? Was it because you have the time or because of the content or um by the book's determination to go on selling even though it wasn't being reprinted by then? Right. Um, there are a lot of booksellers out there still can get their hands on copies. And I didn't like to think that a book that was originally written to reflect um, present day family life, as it was in the 1970s, was now out of date, just plain out of date. I, and I, 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 that didn't feel right. Yeah, totally understand that. And I guess what's what's really exciting and interest, certainly for social historians amongst us, is but what's what's changed? What were the big things, the big ticket items that you thought actually these these are the significant changes in those 50 years? I think the important thing is that it's not the children who change, but it is the environment in which they have to grow and flourish. Um, in other words, what's changed is the nature of families, who is a family, who feels themselves to be a family, um, that, if you like, that social environment is the major change into which most of the other changes fit. Um, understood. And so for parents, I suppose these days, with technology, and advances in devices and how you can access information, there, there's an onslaught of advice, especially across social media as well. And do you, do you think it's harder for parents and families to sort of turn out the noise and listen to their instincts 
books. Do you think that's a bigger challenge? I think the challenge of the amount of stuff that's out there is, first, well, two really. Firstly, contradictoriness. I mean, if you follow a lot of parent guidance on the internet, you'll hear everything from A to Z, and you're still left trying to decide which bits to believe and which not. And also um, knowing who's talking, because a lot of it, I mean, part of the point of the internet is that people don't have to introduce themselves. They don't have to say who they are or where they're coming from. And sometimes you absolutely can't know who you're listening to or whether they're likely to be people you find sympathetic. So I get a lot of correspondence from parents saying exactly that, saying, I'm confused, I'm bewildered. I mean, is it, I don't, oh, excuse me, is it really? My technology is getting away from me again. That's, a, that's okay. It's just really, <laughs> it's just to prove to everyone it really is live. <laughs> um, for instance, is it really the case that no baby should ever be left to nap for more than half an hour at a time is one I've just had. Right. Now, that piece of advice comes in one of the sort of um, getting your baby onto a schedule, which is on the Internet currently. Okay. Um, well, you know, uh, so. There is a case to be made, and we'll see, because I'll see whether this version of the book is of any interest to anybody, that if you can find a voice that feels right to you as a parent, um, that feels sympathetic, that feels knowledgeable, um, the chances are that it won't contradict itself from right. issue to issue. Right. And that's an argument for something as solid and consistent as a book. So we'll see, do people still want books about their children's growth and development? Um, I naturally hope they do because I put two years of my life into this new version, but maybe not, we'll see. And in, and in terms of, aside from books, which clearly there is a demand for, it's still something that people want, um, and I think always will, especially from those from sources, as you say, they can trust. In your view, what, what, are, the, what are the best other places parents can go to um, to get some definitive questions or some really strong supportive questions answered? What, what, what would you recommend, Penelope? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. What, what source would I recommend? Oh, yeah, what, what source would you recommend? Yeah. Um, it so much depends who you are. I mean, if you are somebody who is, in my view, lucky enough to have perhaps a, a mother or mother-in-law, a grandmother, a grandfather, a, a close related person whom you trust and who you feel did a good job with you, that may be your ideal person, not to take advice from necessarily, but to that issues backwards and forwards with. I mean, issues that perhaps are new since his or her day, like the issue of babies and screens. You can't expect um, even the best of grandfathers to have a very educated view of whether one-year-olds should use screens because they weren't around when he was associated with one-year-olds. But this is the thing about consistency. If people's attitudes sit right with you on one issue, they probably will with another. Understood, understood. I've never met anybody who um, smacked their children as a taken for granted disciplinary measure, who shared my attitudes to anything else. It's a kind of, okay. you know, yes or no issue for me. Not necessarily Understood. for everybody, but it is for me. I would never trust a source that had 
a good smack as the final sanction for any age group. Understood, understood. And it was really interesting. You raised the issue of electronic screens. How have you felt that they've impacted on parenting and parent-infant relationship? Or society or life. Yeah. I mean, I have to start. I'm, you know, I'm one of the old and there were no such things when I was growing up or even when I was first in my profession. Um, in fact, my husband had one of the very early computers. Huge it was, it took up the whole back seat of the car. Um, but now, screens of one kind and another are absolutely integral to how we live, how we learn, how we see, how we interact, how we communicate. I mean, look at us today. We're able to do this with the people we're with because of screen access. So it's absolutely useless to start by saying, are screens good for children? Children live in a society that almost centers around electronics and therefore it's down to us to make it work for them and useless to kind of throw up our hands in horror. And are there some mitigations or are there some positives that you can think of that you've come across actually that you could share with others? Huge numbers of mitigations. I mean, I sometimes look back and think how incredibly ignorant I and my sisters were as children compared with the children of today. Ignorant at a really basic factual level, um, such as um, I'd never seen uh, what? I'd never seen a waterfall. When I was six or seven or eight or nine or 10, I only knew a waterfall from a description in Arthur Ransom. Um, what was um, Greenland like? Uh, it, it's straight factual stuff that children today are familiar with because they see it all the time in fiction and in fact. Um, and I think that's really important. Ignorance for us as adults, because now in conversation, a query comes up, you know, how old is somebody or what date will, and you've only got to get out your phone and you can get the answer. Sure. We didn't have any of that. And I think there's a danger of forgetting just how valuable that is. And it should counteract a lot of the risks. I mean, the risks that I worry about are less about children watching and playing games than about the social impact of, of bullying, of not being able to get away from the persona of yourself at school the way we could. You know, if things weren't going well, you could go home for half term and be the other person. Now you can't do that because you're linked all the time with your peer group. Um, so the, the main concern I have about it is if screen is standing in for face-to-face um, -face interaction on the one hand and physical activity on the other. In other words, I don't want children to spend too many hours looking at a screen instead of looking at faces and learning expressions and emotional understanding, um, or sitting there watching other people running in Olympic races rather than racing around the garden. That's the worry. Makes a lot of sense. I, I think all of us can think of circumstances, perhaps even within our own lives, if we have children where we may have relied a bit too much on a screen to, to um, entertain yes. our, our children. So that, that really does make sense. It's, it's hard, though. I mean, 
I could put you up a good argument why you shouldn't put a two-year-old in front of a television screen to get a bit of peace to cook dinner. Um, the argument only applies if the alternative would be to have him bored and whiny around your ankles while you cook. If there's a better alternative, it may be better than the screen. Like, it may be a better alternative to have him in a high chair cooking while you cook. I don't know what the alternative is, but TV is better than nothing but that doesn't mean it's usually as good as people. Understood. And you, you saved me there because I was suddenly thinking, oh, no, I, I did that as well. So much, much appreciated when we used TV for, uh, for a means to get something done because there wasn't a better alternative. But yeah, that's, that's really wise advice. Um, I guess one of the other things that's come through is it, it feels like to, to parents of today that the world's a bit more of a stressful place, really, than 50 years ago. What's What's been learned about stress um, since the book was first published in that 50 years? What's, what, what more is known about stress on babies and children's development, both before they're born, but also uh, A huge up amount to... more, and I think it's a very important part of the whole movement the thousand years, I mean days, sorry, <laughs> um, that within the movement, it is more and more understood that stress on a growing and developing brain starts as a fetus in the womb, not even after birth. Um, and I talk sometimes, I, I, I picked up this phrase, a baby gap, that has been a tendency during these years of COVID to concentrate on impacts on slightly older children. I mean, readiness to learn, readiness for school, um, the disaster of missing school has been the focus of anxiety. When such focus ought to start way back in the third trimester of pregnancies or from immediately after birth. And the reason is a reason that as a society we don't much like, which is I think that mother's stress, maternal stress affects brain development from before birth. Now, you can't get round that by saying a parent is a parent is a parent because we only grow babies in female wombs. So there's a, a point to be made about the importance of mothers and what life is like for them in pregnancy and immediately afterwards that doesn't fit very well with what's the way society is now run. Um, I would like to see a, a calm and stress-free, hopefully a happy pregnancy regarded as every woman's right because it's every child's necessity. That's, that's a really interesting point and I, I think there are I so can't many... remember what your question was. So no, it's way uh, off to, to be honest, your answer is more interesting than the question in the first place. So it, it, I guess that does mean it would take a real transformation around pregnancy in terms of both advice to families uh, and expectant mothers and others, and also basically in terms of the services required, but also what the accepted norms as well. Yes, and I'm appalled also by an actual disregard of what happens in pregnancy. And the example I would give is that during lockdown, when everybody was suffering from exclusions of one kind and another, it didn't seem to be recognized that a woman in labor 
being forced to leave her partner at the door was really a serious issue for her and her imminent baby. And hundreds and thousands, I don't know the figure of women, had a really appallingly traumatic start to being a parent to that child because they were alone, hopefully with midwives in attendance, but not always even that. And it's not that that was the case that's so upsetting. It is that nobody was talking about it. No, absolutely. I, I, re I remember actually lots of instances in, that, in the charity I was working with at the time where there were lots of families raising concerns about that and also about being separated from their babies after birth, um, especially those neonatal wards and elsewhere. Very stressful times. It's, it's really, really, it's really interesting talking through that. I guess since you first wrote the book, what, what things haven't changed that were the fundamentals in your baby and child that still remain the fundamentals in the here and now? Um. It's hard to think what hasn't changed other than the, the pattern of infant development, which does seem to be universal, mondial, and over time also. Um, things like, oh, I don't know, they used to be regarded as milestones. I mean, the really simple things, the order, in which human babies develop different skills. Like, you know, your baby may never crawl, but if he doesn't ever crawl, he certainly won't sit before he's stood. You know, there's a sequence to skeletal muscular development and neurological development too, which is the same everywhere. Um, so that hasn't changed, but what has changed very often is our reactions to those changes. Um, for instance, I think we're less tied to glorifying early um, milestone passages, if you like. Uh, it used to be thought that a baby who was physically forward, if I may so put it, was probably very bright. It's not the case. These systems are interlocked, but they're also different. Um, a child can be cognitively extremely advanced without being physically advanced in the least. Furthermore, a baby doesn't crawl, but bottom shuffles, we now know to be at something of an advantage because if you sit on your bottom and push yourself along, you can sit up and look and see the world and you can have at least one hand free to do things. Whereas if you're crawling, you're looking down, you can't see anything much and your hands are taken up. Now, it, it's a trivial example, but a very clear one of simple social learning. We, we've done the research and know that to be the case. And to all bottom shuffling parents, you know, if you've wondered, don't worry, it's great. Perfect, perfect. And so a, a number of the first 1001 Days Movement supporters um, focus on the role of fathers mm -hmm. or work directly with parents as well. And I'm sure they'd be really interested to understand your thoughts about the unique role of fathers or what, why they're important for babies' mental health, social emotional development? Or even who they are, because fatherhood is a, a biological statement, but it's also a hugely important social role. And a father doesn't have to, a father figure doesn't have to be male. Uh, certainly doesn't have to be biologically the father of the child concerned. This is what I mean about families having changed yep. so completely. But 
and it's a big but, um, there isn't any doubt, in my mind anyway, and most of the research would back this, that from the very beginning or from near the beginning, babies are very aware of differences between men and women, whether mothers, fathers, or whoever. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that fathers who are biological fathers and male tend to interact with their babies in a different way from mothers. And that you could argue, I probably would, that a baby who gets a nice dose of each is getting the best possible relationship meal. Um, I don't think the biology matters to hoots as far as we can see, uh, but I think gender, I'm risking saying this, but I think gender remains an important issue in development, although there are large sectors of society which would like it to mean virtually nothing. It doesn't mean nothing. And as long as babies start in wombs and are delivered out of female bodies, it, gender will remain an issue. A, a, a very thorny subject um, where there's, there's a healthy debate and at times it takes an unhealthy tone. It's, 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 a, re it's a really important one. I've, I'm getting quite a few questions through as well from our listeners, participants, just to remind them if there are any questions that they would like us to share directly with you, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Just have one through um, talking about your book, When Parents Part, and uh, the focus on divorce and family breakdown. And they're particularly interested to understand why, as a child expert, you decided to take on the topic. Um, and, and what would you what would you flag as being really important for those working in this field in terms of an attachment context in those circumstances? Again, I'm not quite clear what you're asking me. Are well, you asking I, I, I think that there are two. That area. There are, two, there are two parts to the question. One is, what, why, did, why did you focus on that area? And two, what's, what's important to bear in mind around attachment between All right. baby, infants, parents, in, in, in that context as well? Right, okay, fair enough. Um, I decided to focus on that area because attachment in infancy is obviously central to my professional development and more and more parental separation and divorce has become a major issue in infants attachment, babies, children's attachment to their parents. Um, I dare say the fact that I was a child of divorce had something to do with it. Um, I certainly felt I knew a certain amount about what it was like to have parents divorcing and so forth. As far as um, the second part of your question goes, there was a certain amount of misunderstanding. There is quite a bulk of good research, mostly from America, that suggested up until perhaps 10 years ago, that the tendency to order that babies of any age should spend X amount of time with fathers, if fathers wished it, irrespective, and this is the crucial thing, of the relationship they had had before the separation was doing damage. And I wrote about this, and it was in some quarters taken as an anti-father um, message. It wasn't. It was an anti-claiming um, a relationship that you haven't already established. That was the point. Right. Where a baby has had a relationship with both parents, from the beginning or from very near the beginning, then of course 
the last thing you want to do if parents separate is for the baby to lose either half or any of that. But particularly earlier, a, a generation ago, a great many of the fathers who were insisting on these weekends had had really very little to do with their babies up to that point because we were still living in a society where the vast majority of the care of children was in the hands of their mothers and many, many fathers really didn't know their children very well. Now, a lot of them made it work, but there were a lot of very distressed toddlers and younger who weren't given the chance to get to know this bloke before mummy walked out from Friday to Monday. And that was the message. And I see now why it was misunderstood by some of the many fathers who were struggling for their parental rights in sure. sure. Um, but it was never intended that way. And if you read it not in a fathering fury, but with interest and curiosity, it is clear in the book that that's the case. Understood. Understood. Well, th thank you for those, that question. Thank you for contextualising the background to, to that, that particular book as well. It's really, really helpful. Another question we've had in is, in 50 years of your research, what, what, have, what have you found that you think helped babies' mental health and the well-being of families the most? What were the pieces of research that you just thought, gosh, yeah. That Only really underpins it. Or that's always been the case? Well, um, perhaps always been the case, but added to with uh, greater knowledge and understanding in recent years? I mean, I think stress, both in parents and in the developing and growing brain of babies, has been hugely underestimated and is enormously important. Um, we now know that if a mother in the third trimester is really stressed out, particularly if her stress relates to uh, her relationship with her partner or worries about the development of the fetus, those are the two crucial things, um, the hormone load carried by the bloodstream via the placenta to the baby actually affects the brain development of that child. And if it, the stress is acute and long lasting, then that baby is at risk of being one of the people we all know so well who overreacts to stress for the rest of his life. You know, we've all got friends who make a major issue of minor disasters, um, fight, flight, reactions that seem unnecessary. Um, and one of the things we've learned is that this goes back to the very earliest months of brain development. Uh, so stress for all concerned, and that of course includes separate attachment and separation because those are both stressful both for the adult and for the child for fathers of course as well as for mothers um, are things we've learned I hope to think about you know there are sayings like happy baby happy mother but we say them rather glibly there's a saying in my family which I think is actually quite useful, which is you can't be happier than your least happy child. And that really is true. If yeah. one of your kids, whether aged one or 11 or 21, is having a really rough time, it will be grinding away in the back of your head and taking the edge off your Christmas. Um, and I think we're more aware then of the strength of parent-child relationships and their importance in the long term, because how we are feeling affects how we interact with our children, 
and how we interact with them is what affects their development more than anything else, more even than poverty or the opposite. So that's that's a biggie. Understood, understood. And you talked earlier about baby gap or baby blind spots in government policy. Certainly that phrase coined during sort of the COVID and COVID recovery plans. What what do you think would be the big ticket items you would like the government to promise and undertake to address that baby blind spot to really to really put babies uh, front and center? I mean, mine. Some people will know is is practically a private campaign, which is that we should rethink children's centres the way they were originally set up and intended to be. Um, I'm not talking about family hubs, which are talking shops and may be valuable, it's not for me to say, but the point about children's centres is that they are somewhere for, uh, they have to be bricks and mortar, not telephone lines and paper and pencil. We need places for adults to take very small children where they can all talk to and relate to their peers, the adults to the adults, the children to the children. And if you've got that going on, you're not going to ignore the babies because they won't let you. The trouble with COVID, with the lockdown and the baby gap is that the babies weren't seen, of course, and they were very largely forgotten. Uh, and it's too late by three to try and pick up on what you've been losing. And I mean, a simple example, I didn't see anybody until after the second lockdown was over who picked up on what we were trying to say about the necessity of wearing masks and whether they were really necessary and so forth. Babies learn from people's faces. They learn from watching people. Any baby faced with a face or a face-like picture, you know, we start from the eyes, scan down to the chin, go back up to the nose, finish on the eyes. And that's how they learn about people and eventually about feelings and expressions and so on. To put all the adults that child sees accept within the confines of home into masks was a really serious thing to do. Now, don't think I'm saying it shouldn't have been done. I don't know, I'm not an epidemiologist. I can't say whether it was the right decision, but it was horrifying that nobody was picking it up from the point of view of sure. very small children. Sure. And do you think, we, do you have ongoing concerns about that generation of babies that experience that? And, and, and... I've got ongoing concern about what is happening in society to everybody. And that, of course, means to children also. My principal concern for government is that if I were up there, I'd be putting children first and they seem to be being put last. How can we accept that we live in a society where there are children, any children who haven't got enough to eat? In the UK, in this century, people say just that, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said endlessly, but it's still the case. And there's a great deal of misunderstanding, I think, about how much is being done about underprivilege, about poverty. For example, people believe that food banks are there for people who need food to go and get food. So they are three days if somebody's recommended you. You can't go on. Um, all right, there are setups now that are doing a little better, you know, where you can pay three pounds or five pounds and 
go on picking up your food for that indefinitely. But food banks are not are not that. Um, nobody, to my knowledge, mentioned formula milk during all the discussion of food poverty. And they're still not talking about it. And they're still not. Government is not making the point that is one of the changes in my book, that there are a huge range of formula milks available at a huge range of different prices. And really, parents, you don't have to buy the more expensive to show that you care, because in all nutritional terms that matter, they're all the same. And advertisers are very good at convincing us that caring parents spend more. Um, I'm sorry, I can rattle on. I get <laughs> upset about a lack of priority being given to the beginning of childhood because so much of childhood is based on infancy and all of adulthood is based on childhood. Sure, sure. And um, actually on, the, on that point, if I have a question in, um, and it's, it's a question about your thoughts on antenatal care. Um, and the point here is, is it too heavily fo focused on physical well-being? rather than mother and baby's emotional well-being. And what would a more balanced approach achieve and how can it be achieved? You know, I think it's one of the few things where it may have been better in the old days than it is now. I mean, when I look back to having my own children, um, antenatal care was very personal, very intimate. Okay, you didn't always see the same midwife every visit, but you had a series of visits. Um, your local clinic was interested in whether you attended or not. You certainly knew all the women involved in it before you got to the end of your pregnancy. And likewise, follow-up was pretty personal. Um, and then, of course, there's the tragic story of health visiting, which used to be one of the best things about Britain. It probably still is one of the best things about Britain, but health visitors are not allowed or helped or supported to be what they were to every parent in the UK. The beauty of health visiting, even 30 years ago, was that it was universal, that there was absolutely no stigma attached to the health visitor turning up to your house. So there was no reason for anybody to be against it. And it was there for you whenever. You had a telephone number you could ring. You could take your slightly older baby to the clinic anytime you were concerned. Now try taking your slightly older baby about whom you're slightly concerned to your GP. You'll be lucky if you get through the door in most practices. So I think the, the points, if, if I'm correct, Penelope, are the well-being of mother and baby came from that relationship-focused care, both from midwife and from health visitors, which I guess by implication we've lost to an extent. But don't you think, because I do, that offering personalised care was a concentration on relationships? Uh, that's certainly something I, I see. Um, I'm not, I, I think I'm not understanding quite what you're getting at. No, no, it, 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 was, it was in relation to... <laughs> How does antenatal how does antenatal care um, really focus on mother's well-being, baby's well-being? And and the point you were making was it felt more personal. It felt, and therefore, in being more personal with a deeper relationship, there were it was more attuned to both mother and baby's well-being. That's that's what I heard in your response, unless I've got that wrong. 
Um, no, I think we, we have to address this again, because that's not what I meant. Um, I was talking about recognition of the relationship. Uh, you're talking, I think, about how important it is. Yes? Uh, I, I was. I, it could be me misinterpreting it, that's all. Or the question is about how important it is. Is that right? Um, because one of the things we have learned, and this comes straight out of research, so I'm confident in, you know, confident in saying it, is that um, a baby's socio-emotional development absolutely depends on the relationship that he or she has with parents or people who stand in for parents. Now, that simply wasn't known. Um, and indeed, I don't think certain established um, parts of our society, such as adoption procedures and laws, would have developed the way they have if it had been understood how important those relationships were. Um, and it really is the case. It is the relationship a baby has with his or her principal carers, whoever they may be, that builds his view of the world and himself in it. And of course, physical care and physical development are hugely important. How could they not be? But they're certainly not more important than that emotional sure. relationship. And in my view, probably slightly less. I mean, I'd sooner be asked to participate in the um, mending care of a deprived child who was physically deprived than in one who had been emotionally deprived, it would be easier to build back what had been lost than it is within the emotional setting. Thank you for that. Um, and we've got one last question that's, that's come in as well. Um, much of your advice is given from a baby or young person's perspective. Why, why did you choose to, to, to take that approach? Sorry, again, I, you're so, sorry. Heard. Uh, my apologies. So much of, the, much of the advice in the book is given from a baby or young child's oh, right. perspective. And, and why, why did you choose to write it in that way? Oh, gosh. Um, partly, I think, because that's how I think about it. Yeah. Um, you know, what would be the point, it would just be another medical text if you wrote it from a paediatric point of view, and certainly a psychological point of view can be positively damaging. Um, you know, if you're trotting out findings that are not based in feeling. Um, so also, I think it's what most parents actually want to think about, want to know, if you like, is what is best for my child? What is my child feeling or doing or likely to be feeling or doing tomorrow when you're facing, I don't know, first day at playgroup or first day nursery? Your concern is how it will impact the child. So it seems to me obvious to write it from that point of view, although, of course, very often, I don't know any more than anybody else what your particular child will feel like. I can only offer what is known, what is observed, what seems likely. Um, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect parent and who will be a good enough parent, only you who know your child can possibly judge. Thank you so much for that. That's really, really excellent advice, really excellent background. Thank you for answering all those questions that have been sent in um, by attendees and those that couldn't quite make it this time around. Um, that's the end of this session. We're just a couple of minutes early. Um, good luck at 
Windsor Castle tomorrow. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your thoughts and all of your efforts into supporting babies and families and children. Um, so we'll leave it there and wish you and all the other participants a really, really lovely afternoon. So thank you. It's been I a real pleasure. Everybody a very happy Christmas when we get there. Of course, of course. Perfect. Well, thank you once again. Thank you for everyone who joined us. We're holding another session early in the new year. So thank you.